the spanish stage in the time of lope de vega by stephen f austin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Spanish Stage in the Time of Lope de Vega To the student of world drama, The Spanish Stage in the Time of Lope de Vega by Professor H. A. Renart of the University of Pennsylvania should prove of interest. The book was published by the Hispanic Society of America in 1910, but despite the fact that it has been on the market for over a year, it appears to be little known. This is unfortunate in view of the much valuable and detailed information it contains concerning the origin and development of the Spanish drama in a period which corresponds both in point of time and of attainment to our own Elizabethan epoch. Beginning with the inception of the drama in Spain, which, as in England, was at the very altar of the church, Dr. Rennert traces its course through the autos sacramentales and all their forms to the comedia, which found its perfection at the hands of Calderon and Lope de Vega. In Spain, as in England, the drama rapidly became secularized passing successively from the hands of the church to those of the municipalities and the trade guilds. The religious drama, however, did not die out, as in England, but persisted side by side with the more popular form of amusement. Indeed, some of Lopez's most uh, successful compositions were written for performance during the Corpus Christi Festival in Madrid. To the student of English drama, the histories of The Globe and the Blackfriars Theatres in London are matters of prime interest, but to him who widens his field and views the drama not in its national but in its world aspect, the accounts of the Corral de la Cruz and the Corral del Principe, which Dr. Renart has given us should prove of equal importance. And scarcely second, those of the Huerta de Doña Elvira and the Coliseo in Seville, where many of the masterpieces of Spanish dramatic literature were performed for the first time. These, like most of the public theatres in Spain, were founded by charitable organizations as a source of revenue and continued under their control for many years, being leased to the managers of various theatrical companies. As to their structure, their equipment, the conditions under which they operated, and the restrictions to which they were subject, we find an admirable account in our book. Those who have pondered similar problems in connection with the Elizabethan stage will appreciate the fullness of detail. The student will not be balked at every turn by that meagerness of data which makes all accounts of our own early theatres largely matters of conjecture. In no country did the drama receive so much encouragement as in Spain. Nowhere did it become so much a part of the national life. In view of this fact, it is not surprising to find the theatres mentioned again and again in the public records of the times. The city often undertook theatrical productions, especially those of a religious nature, and the entries of disbursements, still preserved, are often illuminating. Indeed, so important an adjunct to the community did the theater become, that when the Coliseo in Seville was destroyed by fire, the city ordered it rebuilt, and then, not being satisfied with the job, tore it down and remodeled it at its own expense. Such interest on the part of the municipality as such is significant. As with the public theatres in England, scenery and stage devices of all kinds were comparatively late acquisitions. But, on the other hand, the church autos and the court representations 
early acquired a magnificence of scenic effect. This was imported from the Italian stage, and, as might be expected, in the course of time, the public theatres began to follow the example at first slowly and with the utmost naivete, but finally becoming more sophisticated, more and more ingenious, until in the days of Lope de Vega they had acquired a remarkable skill in staging. Indeed, that great poet was driven to complain more than once quote, that in these days the people come to see a comedy not to hear it. Unquote. The costumes, too, became more elaborate, more expensive, and much more immodest, with what effect we shall presently see. Despite the fact that the theatres became so popular, certain cities threatened to close them because they kept the laborers from their work, acting, as a profession, was and always continued in disrepute. During the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, Spain was overrun with bands of strolling players. As a rule, they were a happy-go-lucky, shiftless lot, recruited from the lower classes. They led a hand-to-mouth existence, often giving a performance in exchange for a meal, and even in those days were marked people, by reason, quote, of the looseness of their lives, especially the women, unquote. But even among the better and more prominent companies, blatant immorality was rife. This brought about much opposition on the part of the clergy, and also a good deal of restrictive legislation. It was unfortunate that professional players were often engaged to perform the Easter autos, and the appearance of some exceptionally notorious actor or actress in a saintly role was the subject of more than one philippic against the stage. But under the circumstances it was not surprising that virtue retired from the boards at an early date. The nomad life to which their profession subjected them, coupled with the demands made upon the players by the dreaded mosquitero, or pit, which delighted in all lasciviousness, were by no means conducive to clean living. Moreover, the architecture of the theatres was unfortunate. The dressing-room was often a community affair, and the managers seemed to experience the greatest difficulty in excluding the public from them. So demoralizing did these conditions become that the authorities sought to remedy them by legislation. From time to time heavy fines were imposed upon the violation of what privacy the dressing and green rooms afforded. In 1596, legislation went further and closed the profession to unmarried women. These decrees, however, like all similar ones, seem to have had little effect. As might be expected, this immorality showed itself not only behind the scenes, but before the footlights as well. The dance had long had its place in all forms of public amusement, and by the end of the sixteenth century, it had become the most powerful attraction of the commedia, almost displacing the more legitimate forms of acting. As public fancy wearied of one, another was invented, and each was an improvement over its predecessor in point of impropriety. The climax was reached in 1588, when the escaraman, the chacona, and the pestiferous zarabanda were introduced. It was in reference to these that the laws regulating costume were passed. Under these circumstances, it is but natural that the church should have headed the opposition against the stage. But in Spain, it never went to the same lengths we find in England after the Reformation. In that blessed clime, the stage found no Puritans to contend with. Nevertheless, because of its position, the church often was able to bring great pressure to bear upon the town councils, even upon the king, and what regulation there was is traceable directly to its influence. In the king, however, the church usually found a poor ally. This is especially true of Philip the Fourth, during whose reign the Commedia attained the zenith of its development. 
From his earliest youth, Philip had been an ardent supporter of the theatres, often sending them comedias from the royal pen. But his enthusiasm, as Dr. Bennett points out, appears to have been due as much to his extraordinary weakness for actresses as to any genuine love of art. His courtiers followed his example, and under their lavish patronage, the actors became a turbulent and unruly class. Whatever the origin of this royal support, it ripened conditions for a glorious epoch in the history of Spanish drama. The king drew to his court all who became eminent in their connection with the stage. Among the writers who thronged thither, Calderon and Lope de Vega were the most famous. Their compositions were often performed at court, under the direction of most noted managers, and the poets personally superintended the stage of their work. In these days the representations attained a magnificence never before dreamed of. Even the autos at the Corpus Festival surpassed in the matter of expensive stage device. Philip interfered with the public theatres in the most arbitrary fashion, sometimes summoning an actor or even a whole company right in the midst of a performance. In view of these facts, it is no great wonder that by the middle of the century we find the theatrical profession as dependent upon the king as upon the public. But, in regard to the drama, the effects of Philip's rule could not be staved off by any amount of royal patronage. By the latter half of the seventeenth century, the country had become poverty-stricken, bankrupt. Honest labor had come to be held in contempt, and because of royal extravagance, taxation was excessive. In the theaters, this found expression in a waning popularity, and the managers were no longer able to meet expenses without the aid of the king. Moreover, with the single exception of Calderon, the great poets who had reared the fabric of a wonderful national drama were dead. The comedias that were produced were inferior, and failed to stimulate the dying public interest. It was easy to see that the end was near and that another great period in the history of dramatic art was drawing to its close. Dr. Innert's book is an admirable commentary upon the conditions under which the Commedia grew, flourished, and declined. Where detail would prove of value to the student, detail is not lacking, and those who read the book with a more superficial interest will find much to hold their attention. The text is enlivened from time to time with eyewitness accounts of various performances, or with reminiscences, often autobiographical in nature, of the many vicissitudes of some strolling player. The book should come as a welcome addition to the library of any one interested in the drama from its historical side, and the fact that the book is published by the Hispanic Society, and so far as we know, is being pushed by no publisher, makes it an especial duty of the reviewer to call attention to its critical interest and scholarly importance. End of The Spanish Stage in the Time of Lope de Vega by Stephen F. Austin